everyone. Uh, welcome to our third episode in season four of Paideia. Today, I'm Scott Masson here with my esteemed colleague, Dr. Bill Friesen. And today we're talking about Joseph Conrad. Conrad is uh, quite a, an interesting man uh, and extraordinary in his own right, insofar as he writes in English, but English is not a first language for him. He, he was a Polish uh, uh, man born actually in the Russian Empire in a, uh, a place called Berdachev in 1857. He dies in 1924, so at the age of uh, 66. And he doesn't learn English until his 20s. So given that fact, it's rather extraordinary that he should acquire such a facility with the English language as to write one of the great uh, novels of the uh, 19th or 20th century, depending on uh, where you see it. It's you know, it's published in 1899, so right in the cusp of that period. Um, in terms of the novel that we're going to look at, uh, Heart of Darkness, which we mentioned last time, uh, we're going to see it as a pivot point between uh, the realism of the 19th century, which we can see some features of here, but also early features of modernism, which we're pivoting towards, and we will get to uh, next week in earnest when we deal with uh, T.S. Eliot and the modernist movement. Uh, this uh, novel, like so many of Conrad's novels, takes place uh, or through the eyes of a seaman. And that is to some degree, some degree autobiographical, or at least in terms of both uh, themes and uh, in terms of setting, because Conrad himself uh, served for many years as a sailor. So all of those things are interesting and are certainly features of many of his novels. Um, I found, I've taught this novel myself uh, for uh, many years now, and I still find it uh, mysterious. And I don't think that there's going to be an, any dispelling of that, because that's partly uh, the point of the novella, is to cast some mystery upon what's going on. And we'll explore the nature of that. Uh, mystery and to some degree confusion in this episode today. But Bill, do you want to say anything about this as an introductory remark? Yeah, I find the man fascinating. Um, I too, like you, have been teaching this novella for many years. And it's a text which fascinates and yet baffles and frustrates my students every year, every time I teach it. Um, and I think, as you say, that that's necessary to the appeal of this story, this narrative, uh, it taps into um, this notion mentioned by Flannery O'Connor that the most profound stories that we can tell uh, must by their very nature defy paraphrase. You're not going to easily paraphrase what the heart of darkness is about. And that's actually a virtue, I think, ultimately. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a text which has drawn me back to it numerous times. I don't mind teaching it repeatedly year after year because I'm always discovering something new and interesting about it. Uh, I should also note that uh, Joseph Conrad, as you say, he's known as one of the greatest writers of the 20th century, though, as you say, he's already active as a writer prior to that time. And I think it absolutely fascinating that uh, this incredibly well-crafted text is written by a man who's, uh, who doesn't have English as a first language. This is a, this is a, a, a second language to Conrad. I also find it rather interesting that um, his view of the world and his view of humanity and his view of himself is shaped by forces which uh, have not shaped many of the writers we've looked at and will be looking at here. This is a man who was close to the ocean uh, when he was a sailor. Uh, in his early days, he was serving on board sailing ships, uh, oftentimes in incredibly rough conditions. And that's how he kind of grew up. And so the, the, the man is formed rather differently than a lot of these other writers at whom we've uh, taken a look. Another thing I should say at the front end here is that invariably, if I have heard people comment on or teach the heart of darkness, they can't seem to help themselves in 99% of the cases. And they want to turn the text into something about colonialism and the evils of colonialism and stuff like this. And uh, there is a critique of colonialism in the text, to be sure. Oh, for sure. But to make that the central guiding concern uh, and value of this text, I think, is uh, almost impossibly reductive and simplistic. 
And uh, while I'm not averse to my students writing about that aspect of the novella, um, it's not something I would necessarily encourage. I think it's about uh, back to a number of these other themes that we've been tracing through so many of the writers in the second uh, half of the Victorian period, which is um, investigations into the nature and indeed, even I would argue in this text, the very reality of meaning and value, because this, I think, gets, uh, to quote the title, this gets to the heart of matters, I think, in that uh, as the character, uh, the narrator, I should say, as the, well, no, as Marlowe's account via the narrator, we're going to have to talk a little bit about the frame story there, um, yeah. as he ventures farther and farther from European civilization, the constructs of value and meaning look increasingly arbitrary and unconvincing until you get down into the heart of darkness where the very notions seem fundamentally ridiculous and bankrupt. And I wanna talk a little bit about that and how that's explored in the text. So that's essentially my setup for the heart of darkness. Is there something else you wanted to say on these fronts? Yeah, I, I mean, you mentioned the colonialism uh, or the critique of colonialism or the idea that Conrad himself is insufficiently uh, critical of the colonialist venture. That charge came fam famously from Chinua Achebe, the Nigerian novelist, um, in his uh, and the writer of the novel Things Fall Apart, which is a riff on um, W.B. Yeats' poem, uh, The Second Coming, uh, just a line from it. Uh, and he his critique of it is basically that Conrad uh, portrayed the Africans as uh, to some degree subhuman um, and because of that um, he said that uh, Conrad was to some degree uh, presenting a view of the Africans which was simply demeaning to the Africans and I think he's rather missing the point there myself I don't think we're supposed to be affirming Conrad's view there it is written from the first person narrative but as you noted there are two frame there are two narratives there there's the frame narrative of the narrator who uh, who is uh, unnamed at the outset and then we're giving the reported speech first person of uh, Conrad himself but even from the perspective of the frame narrator we have good reason to question uh, the moral validity of the account that's being given that's presented in various ways so there's there's no sense that even if he is seeing the Africans in the from the perspective of uh this is a sort of a subhuman people i don't think that conrad is expecting us to agree with that viewpoint there's a there's a, a clear irony in the the portrait there which is presented in various ways uh and and i think it it, it, it i have a difficult time think uh believing that achebe is that incapable of reading a text that he would not note the irony and the use of irony i mean we've seen it ourselves in Swift's a modest uh, proposal, uh, are we supposed to be to be believing that Swift is really seeing the Irish this way, or that he's presenting it in a way so that we are, uh, to some degree, appalled by the portrait that he gives to us? I think that is rather the case. So I, I've I've always been astonished by Achebe's reading of it. Nonetheless, uh, it's very fashionable to read the text that way. Yeah. Um... I tend to think of the Africans portrayed in the novella in three different segments. You've got the Africans who were uh, encountered at the uh, at the outer station. Uh, and I, I think it's very straightforward. We're meant to be shocked and horrified at the conditions under which they're laboring, the pointlessness of the, and the brutality of what it is that they're forced to engage in. Uh, we're meant to respond with simple horror. Um, so I'm not sure how this is magically an endorsement either by Marlowe or Conrad or the narrator, depending on how we want to see that individual. We also have a portrayal of the cannibals on board the riverboat, and they are portrayed as some of the noblest, most, most admirable individuals out there. Um, they're shown to have integrity. Um, they maintain their cool in a crisis. They continue to function. Um, so again, that's a bit at odds with Achebe's reading. And then finally, we have the Africans at the end, those who have been under the sway of Kurtz. Kurtz. Yeah, and instead of being horrified and full of pity, um, I find them vaguely frightening. Um, they're incredibly dangerous. 
uh, and have been, and that has been enhanced by uh, by Kurtz uh, and his regime. So uh, there are three very different takes on Africans in this novella, in my view. Yeah, no, that's that's terrific. And and again, even the whole and now there's no doubt the colonialist backdrop to it. And and I mean literally there's no doubt about it. It's obvious to Conrad. It's obvious to his audience. It's even audience obvious to uh, to us for whom almost nothing historically valid <laughs> and relevant is obvious. So it's obvious that there is a colonialist mindset here. And, and the backdrop for this is the Berlin Conference of 1884, uh, which is sometimes called the Congo Conference. Uh, and it was organized by Bismarck. So, and, and at that conference, basically the Western European powers divided up Africa into colonies and they did it with, in a bloodless fashion. Um, and to some degree, they are regarding the this this place as a place that is simply uh, material wealth and gain for them, the superior uh, nations of the world to do with as they please. That's there. There's no doubt about that. Mm -hmm. And so if we see uh, uh, an element of uh, colonialism in it, there's no doubt that it's there. And, and we can go through the features of the novel that will reinforce that idea. But even Marlowe himself suggests that when he goes to Brussels. Remember, this is the European power that was uh, in control of the Congo, the very center of Africa, deep dark Africa, which is portrayed at this point as a white space on the canvas or on the map, like the, the, the rest of Africa had been colonized, the Congo as of yet had not, so it's a white uh, space on the map of Africa, and yet this is where they were headed, and it was run by Belgium. Okay. And then what happened there? Well, they're in search of ivory, which is a is a luxury good. It's a symbol of civilization. And uh, Marlowe describes it as uh, Brussels itself as a whitewashed sepulcher. Yes. And, and for anyone who has uh, any literary sensibility or any biblical knowledge, which is pretty much ought to be everyone at any rate, the whitewashed sepulcher is a reference to Pharisaism. Yep. So the, the claim of moral superiority, even Marlowe is uh, questioning this. And that's before he leaves into uh, this heart of darkness. So, yeah. I, you know, it's indisputable that the, the, the context, the historical context is there uh, and it's immediately before the story. And then the question, the nature of colonialism and its uh, uh, features, that's really one of the questions here. But there's no doubt, no, I, I cannot see it as an endorsement of colonialism for all my life. No, you've said earlier that uh, this is a fashionable direction in which to take conversations around certain texts, the heart of darkness, the tempest, other texts like this. And it, it is indeed that. Um, but we have to remember that, uh, first of all, and I don't want to get too sidetracked by, by this, but Belgium, Belgium had a particularly nefarious reputation yeah, already in 1899 for its treatment of its uh, uh, colon, uh, colonists or people who had been colonized rather I should say. Yep. Um, so this was already a talking point in uh, in European homes in 1899. They knew this. Um, Marlowe is going to work for these people and he's a little bit uh, I think of him uh, as a little bit like a mercenary. He knows yep. that uh, he's engaged in something reprehensible He's not happy about it, but, uh, you know, this is what he does. He's a river captain and stuff like this. You also signaled that uh, at um, the conference, they had divvied up Africa, and we're seeing it very much in terms of a material repository of resources, economic resources and things like this. And I think uh, this kind of also gets to the point of the um, colonialist critique, which is that the people who were busy engaged in operations in Africa and thus colonizing it, um, these are amor to a large extent, these are amoral uh, companies and, uh, uh, and groupings of individuals and what have you, who are there openly and explicitly telling, telling you, yes, we're here to exploit this place and its people. That's what we're doing. And uh, you could argue that the same process is underway, uh, even as you and I speak. I know that China is investing massive amounts in the infrastructure of Africa right now, but not because of some kind of benevolent impulse. There are lots of resources in Africa, and China wants to be in a good, strong position to uh, exploit those and get those. Um, and it's also this sense of amorality 
it's not immorality, it's amorality. These companies don't care. There's big soulless corporations there to make money. Uh, this also, I think, ties in or dovetails quite elegantly with my broader understanding of the theme or one of the themes of the novella, which is essentially an exploration by Marlowe of the boundaries and the truths, the realities of the codes of meaning and value which guide European civilization at this point in history. Are they a real thing or are they merely illusory? Because the farther you get away from the trappings and the geography of European civilization uh, and high art, um, the more ridiculous they come to seem. And this ties in quite nicely with these amoral companies who are doing amoral things far away from European civilization. Um, so I think there's actually a degree of elegance there. On a side note, I should also note that um, Joseph Conrad himself went on one African river expedition, which nearly killed him. I think it was, I can't remember what it was that just about killed him, but it might have been malaria or it might have been something else. Uh, but Conrad has actually been to similar climbs uh, uh, as we encounter here in the no uh, novel. It's not to say that the novella is... Uh, autobiographical. I don't think it is. But I do think a lot of the content, which we encounter in a lot of the scenes, a lot of the imagery, um, and maybe, yeah, a, a lot of these Conrad knows from real life experience, which is uh, an interesting facet to the text. Yeah, um, I, I concur. Um, and the, uh, so the immediate context there, which is uh, of colonialism, um, is conflated in general and this, we, we talked about this a little bit beforehand as well and and i do want to address this a little bit although it's going to distract us ever so slightly from the novel itself but there's a conflation of the critique of colonialism with a critique of christianity as well by contemporary critics as well um and i think that that is also quite frankly uh, absurd um insofar as uh, the Christian missionary movement long antedates this period and the period of colonialism that we're talking about. Remember, 1884 is when the colonization of Africa takes place, in particular uh, from this conference in Berlin in 1884. So it's a really late 19th century development um, of this colonial movement, the, the rush for Africa. And by this point, the world missionary movement had is a century old. And, uh, and, you know, so when we think of Stanley Livingston and so forth, this is long before this period and has no colonialist intent whatsoever, let alone imperialist intentions, is a very different thing. So we mustn't say that every European uh, individual that's gone out of Europe to the regions of Africa or India, in the case of William Carey, has gone so with the purposes of exploitation and colonialization. On the contrary, it's a very different motivation. And in contemporary scholarship, they're often conflated. So Christianity is a sort of a colonizing religion and so forth. This is to uh, have no historical sensibility whatsoever. No, and it dovetails also, again, into fashionable narratives that we tend to spin around texts like this, and which don't seem to have much of a basis in fact. And, and Christianity is really plays very little role in either uh, Conrad's own life, as far as I know, or in the novel for that matter. It's just simply not there. Uh, what is being portrayed is the mercantile impulses uh, and to some degree the uh, uh, predatory impulses of the European powers who really are exploiting those there. And nonetheless, there is a critique that uh, Conrad uses of them, which almost of necessity has to draw on Christian language to describe what's going on. So there's a Pharisaism there. There's a whitewashing. There's a, uh, the, even the moral impulse, we're gonna civilize the Africans. Uh, some of the, the speakers in the no novella speak in such terms, but very soon as Marlowe himself descends into the Congo, we find that he starts to lose his moral compass and the figure of Kurtz has lost it altogether and in fact is entirely cynical about what's going on uh, and that would draw into question the moral integrity of those who are colonizing but again there's not even on conrad's part there's no association of that with christianity whatsoever no i may as well tip my my hand here a little bit and uh my read on conrad at the end of the day and it remains speculative 
is that the man himself at the end of his days was a nihilist, um, like so many of these writers that we're encountering here. And uh, the explorations that we encounter in the heart of darkness are the explorations of the limits of meaning and value. Yeah, uh, no, I agree. And broadly speaking. Um, this is where I usually mention anecdotally to my students that I've become very careful about who I take camping with me for similar reasons. <laughs> because uh, there's a kind of a person I've learned how to spot them now if you take them out into the wilds of the woods and all the rules and etiquette and protocols of just behaving decently and in a normal mature manner seem to fall away and you end up with this person running around naked uh, playing with fire and stuff like that and screaming at the woods and it's just not an experience you want. Um, take so, your word for it. <laughs> yeah. So you'll have to, you, you won't find people who can take their sense of civilized comportment and values with them into the wild places. And that's actually a rarer thing than you might, uh, than, than we might think at the front end. Yeah, very interesting. And we see it, it, hasn't, again. it hasn't penetrated their hearts. It's something that they wear on their sleeves, as it were. No, it's imposed upon them by the surrounding complexities of civilized life and social expectations and things like this. And when that is taken away, when the external conforming powers are taken away, this inner shapeless wildness tends to emerge. Um, and we do encounter that, I think, very, very dramatically and epically in the heart of darkness. We move into a realm that is, it's not just amoral, um, it is ferocious, it is violent, it is savage, it is primeval in the worst possible sense. Um, in this world where uh, Marlowe ultimately ends up, uh, and the world in which Kurtz has been moving for years, in fact, um, it's simple. You are either predator or your prey, and that's that. Um, yeah, so I, on that note, I, so I, I entirely agree with you there, and I also think it raises certain issues we've already flagged up um in this podcast about the um admiration in this period for uh progressive individuals who are going beyond the boundaries of civilization for the sake of progress and advancement and the nature of the progress that depends on the worldview that informs it beforehand and in this period remember the the, the novella is published in 1899 uh Darwinism is on fire in England and very popular as a way of explaining, um, among other things, the ascent of the British people to a worldwide empire. Mm -hmm. It's given naturalistic uh, rationale. And obviously, uh, we know that the uh, origins of, uh, of uh, Nazi Germany, to some degree, are often connected with, with Bismarck and Prussian notions, remember, and these are connected with colonialism, with expansion and with the Deutsche Volk. Um, and, and to some degree that is being presented in the novella as well. There's a belief in the um, manifest destiny, as it were, of, uh, it's a term used in the United States for North America, but it's also of all the European powers that they have the natural right for their species to overcome all other uh, different species. Eventually it will be other Europeans, but it begins here in Africa. So there is a sort of a social Darwinism that informs the novella, which ultimately has no moral compass besides uh, conquest. And there's goodness in that. And it seems to me that Marlowe begins as a critic of this view. And in the end, because of his fascination for the figure of Kurtz, who has put himself beyond the boundaries of civilized conduct, he ends up admiring the man which he himself to some degree uh, is. So, And I agree with you that to some degree that's probably Conrad's own position, that there is no moral integrity to the human being. It is uh, a rapacious uh, creature who wears trousers and so forth, but nonetheless, if you scratch the surface, there is a, there is a heart of darkness there. Yeah, there's this notion that um... Well, first of all, let me respond to, uh, I think that's an interesting point you make, that there's a degree of evolutionary legitimacy that attaches to those who can dominate. And I'm oftentimes surprised because that's a, it's a popular notion, or remains a popular notion right up to this day. Uh, and yet in a heartbeat, that same person who is espousing and advocating for evolutionary legitimacy when it comes to taking things over and dominating certain fields and stuff like this, 
in the next breath, they are inveighing against the injustices of colonialism and stuff like this. Yeah. They don't seem to realize that they're holding a mutually contradictory position and they're actually verbalizing it for all the world to see. Um, and, you know, it, it continues to persist. We see it again, you know, uh, with uh, the publication of the selfish gene and stuff like this. Richard um, Dawkins, yeah. Yeah, it's, this is not an idea that's um, gone away. Necessarily anchored to its aid. Um, this is an idea that travels. This is an idea that is now a steady state which continually renews itself every generation in Western culture. So I find that particularly unsettling. Let's just put it that way. And you're right. We end up with, we move through uh, certain points in the novella whereby we can see that various things out there, various human concepts about uh, or notions about suffering, about self worth, about beauty, about um the uh, um, religion and stuff like this these all get shown in the exploration by the uh, by marlowe to be to some extent or another illusions carefully constructed and sometimes not so carefully constructed illusions that we tell ourselves and build up around ourselves and affirm in, it, in ourselves and each other in order to stave off the horror of the alternative that is that the world is a big giant killing machine um and uh, but there are a few heroic figures as you've said uh out there who have the courage to stare straight into the heart Goodness. of darkness mm -hmm. to actually explore it marlowe is one of these characters and kurtz is one of these characters and you're right the kurtz is, is seen by marlowe as a kind of horrific extraordinary horrific, man is his phrase yeah he's he, he's a horrifically impressive predator and Marlowe thinks to himself, yeah, if all the other stuff is illusions, then this is good indeed. It's just pure hegemonics, it's pure power, and he's to be feared and admired, like some kind of ancient uh, homicidal king or something like this. Yeah, we saw we saw this theme back when we looked at Frankenstein as well, didn't we? And another frame narrative uh, in the sense that Walton begins that narrative and encounters Victor Frankenstein wandering the fields of ice. Yes. And likewise, the, that novel is populated with with sublime landscapes, likewise this one. But rather than the icy uh, Arctic regions or that of Mont Blanc there in uh, Frankenstein, here it is the uh, ponderous nature of uh, of the Congo, uh, mm -hmm. which has an ominous presence and, and the, novel, the novella begins uh in a, a degree of darkness but it's the darkness of the fog and so there's a there's an obscurity uh which is one of the marks of the sublime at least according to edmund burke um and is is characteristic i would say of fiction thereafter an obsession with the sublime but with along with the sublime this idea of irrationality and power mm. that pervades the novel there's the symbol of symbolism of power uh, and a rationality and nonetheless of strength and, and of uh, um, the underlying force that makes everything work. But that's there throughout the period and it's really strong in this novel, I think. Yeah, I note this to my students. I, I tell them to pay attention to the, not just sort of the geographical progress of the narrative, but also a lot of the imagery, as you say, it starts in fog, where we have this uh, sort of haunted setting uh, in Belgium while he's there, uh, as he's moving to, uh, deeper and deeper into the heart of darkness, of course, the jungle around him is full of gloom and shadow and stuff like this. Uh, the novel is typified by continuous scenes of inscrutability in which great power and danger lies. And this is not, again, Conrad is not being terribly original when he does this. I want to also uh, talk about a couple of other points that you mentioned here, because they're they're good. But he has a Rousseauvian view of nature, so it's not he's not returning to a primal scene like the Garden of Eden, where everything is good. He's nope. returning to the earliest beginnings when the vegetation riots on Earth and the big trees were king, to quote a passage there. It's it's a uh, a view of nature uh, to use, uh, I think it's Tennyson's phrase, red in tooth and claw with raven. It's a savage, brutal, um, uh, inhospitable, um, um, utterly destructive and amoral force. And yeah. he's tapping into that. Yeah, I, I do talk about the sublime as well when it comes to this novel, because it does show up, I think, 
uh, but it is a very, very dark vision of the sublime. Um, it does fill one with awe and wonder, and one would almost want to tack on the word horror uh, oh, yes. as one experience it. Horror is primal to this, and this, of course, connects it more closely with a narrative like um, Frankenstein. Uh, the, and again, another aspect of the sublime here uh, that we ought to note is that uh, we don't contextualize it. It contextualizes us. Yes. Um, so one can have no illusion that somehow one is going to grapple with nature and come out in uh, victorious. That's not going to happen. That's, that's a ridiculous um, expectation. It is going to destroy you. It's going to devour you. It's going to take you in. It's going to... It's, it's one of the features of the sublime, actually. Burke says that it is the feeling of powerlessness in the face yeah. of this immenseness, this immensity. That's the set, sense that the sublime has, whereas the beautiful is the opposite. It's power over something else. That's what gives us the sense of the beautiful. But here it's the sublime in the sense of a great power in, in the face of which we have no hope of survival. No, it'll, it, it kills everyone in the end. Everyone is taken down by this thing. And this brings up another connection with Frankenstein, which is that, um, which is that Kurtz, like Dr. Frankenstein, plays God uh, with the stuff of life. Uh, but um, what Kurtz is constructing is not a creature, but rather a moral universe for himself and uh, his minions. Good. And uh, because in the absence of God, um kurtz himself has the courage and capability to actually pick up that role for himself and he begins playing god and he begins constructing a moral universe according to kurtz yeah he's no and, and i think he's the nietzschean ubermensch there right he is the man who's beyond good and evil he is the he is the top man uh in the in the the narr i taught explain the idea of the ubermensch as the as the top man on mm -hmm. on a, a, a expedition climbing at the top, that's where he is. He is that top man and everyone else is underneath him. There is nothing that chains him to the cliff face, but his own strength. That's right. And he, and, and so if there is no good in universe, then he is free to create it and manipulate it as he likes. And he does, and it's terrifying. It, it's, it's of a piece with his environment, his amoral environment. Well, it's not, not amoral anymore. There is a sort of a giant twisted morality imposed upon it by this godlike figure. Um, and I use the term godlike in a very pointed sense. Um, no, you're not praising him. So he's putting the no. heads of the of of, of the uh, natives on pikes on spike uh, pikes around him, right? So these these skulls. It's a horrid scene. Um, he's yeah. doing it through sheer brutal force, and the uh, Africans believe that he is a god, uh, and it's. Uh, when uh, he he gets a, a spear in his back, one of the that uh, they realize that he's just a man. One of the other figures, and they are uh, appalled by this fact because they had at that point considered him in their naivete to be a god because of the force of the you know, among other things the rifles he held and so forth. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, our listeners should also know that uh, obviously Conrad wrote a fair number of different texts and different types of texts, in, uh, including this. This is, I think, probably one of the most famous, if not the most famous novella in English. Um, but he also was a writer of novels. I think I mentioned uh, the other day that uh, he wrote a text, uh, amongst other ones, called The Secret Agent. Yeah. Uh, don't read it. That's time you'll want back on your deathbed. Um, it's incredibly depressing. It's very well written, but uh, it's it's an enormously dark text. You think Heart of Darkness is... is uh, depressing uh it's got nothing on the secret age but he also writes short stories and things like this as well he wrote another kind of um precursor if you will to the heart of darkness uh, a rather shorter text which uh it follows the general contours of the heart of darkness but it's not the same thing uh and some of his short stories are actually quite positive rather than uh, these rather more depressing texts as well i want to also add another thing here uh, about frankenstein and what you say about uh, kurtz rising to the position of uber ubermensch the ubermensch um which is that we don't really see what it is kurtz does that makes him so great we never actually see kurtz in that kind of action we only ever encounter kurtz when he's on his way down and out he's on his deathbed virtually yeah. Yes. Um, and one of the things that it seems to be implied, and I could be getting my reading slightly skewed here, is that one of the qualities that makes Kurt so 
impressive is this sheer will to power. Um, the man is driven by a tremendous, terrifying courage and willpower to dominate this most savage of environments while he still can before it kills him. Uh, so again, we've got rather Nietzschean language working its way in here. I think that Conrad was quite sympathetic to certain Nietzschean notions, and this is one of them, the Wille zur Macht. Um, so we need to take that into account as well. And the other thing I want to say before I forget is that when we encounter someone playing God in Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, there is a cautionary counterpoint that this is deadly uh, and this ends in disaster and it is wrong to try to do it. Yes, yes. You don't get that sense that there's a nihilistic sense to the heart of darkness, but there seems to be almost an implicit advocacy of- Or simply an acceptance. Yeah, you accept the fact that, it, uh, that uh, nature, which is a killer, is gonna kill you too. But before it does so, can you flourish as a predator and for how long and how greatly? Because that's essentially what Kurtz does. Um, so there is no with that, with that in mind, the lack of God in the novel is sort of telling, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, some of my students say, you know, is Kurtz a bad guy? And I tell my students, according to the the world that is set up here by Conrad, that's a nonsensical question. There are no good guys. There are no bad guys. There's just successful predators and unsuccessful predators and prey. And that's that. Um, so it doesn't make sense to talk about villains and good guys and heroes and stuff like this. This is a world beyond that language, beyond those matrices and structures. Uh, and once you can see that those things no longer apply to the narrative, a lot of the mysterious parts of this narrative begin to fall into place as a horrible, horrible logic to the world that is constructed here by Kurtz and the narrator as well in Marlowe. This is a great point. Um, I, I agree. And I think that uh, within the premises of the novella and probably of Conrad himself, the question is nonsensical. But we, uh, the reader, I think, raise the very justice questions which those that want to read it as a colonialist novel also raise. And I think that that's um, inappropriate uh, for the reasons we've suggested already. It's not, that's really not what the novella is about. On the other hand, it's uh, to be expected that we're going to raise questions of justice and so forth, because I think the, no the uh, framework with which Conrad approaches the world and that of the late 19th century is absurd and unlivable. And it did result in the First World War to some degree. I think it, it, there's a clear, bright line that connects uh, the events of the First World War with this sort of nihilistic mindset. And it, it persists beyond that into the philosophical nihilism of the 20th century. But the real question then is, even though it doesn't occur to Conrad what the real heart of darkness is, I would say it is the sinful human mind. That is the heart of dark, at the heart of darkness. I mean, let's ask the big questions then. What is the heart of darkness? Well, mm -hmm. for Conrad, it's it's unclear really. It remains unclear. The, the novel be, novella begins in obscurity. It, it concludes in obscurity. There's no clear ending to it. It's it, We're left with this amoral, just um deception and so forth that even the uh, narrator of the framework uh, concludes on a very ambiguous note but we don't have to uh, be satisfied with that conclusion we can say hold on a second this betrays to some degree the depravity of the human heart when it when it is uh, not constrained by any lawful sense of decency or civilization and what is the source of that law and that's when i as a christian will speak about um, about God and about uh, his Christ who he, he, he sent as a propitiation for human sin mm -hmm. and about the judgment and, and the invariable categories that we use to raise the question of justice. You know, why do we perceive it to be unjust? I mean, it is unjust, of course, but why do we think that that is a true and valid category? I think that it is, but Conrad doesn't. No, Conrad seems to end with a vague notion that uh, kind of a, 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 an intellectual shrug of the shoulders saying, I guess it's all pointless violence and suffering. And uh, I'll get what I can, I guess, from because uh, Marlowe doesn't seem to have reached any strong conclusions by the end of the text. Nope. Um, all he does is uh, he resolves to tell a lie to the fiance. Yeah, he lies to the beloved. Yeah. We'll come back. We'll talk about that maybe a little bit in, in just a minute. But I do say a couple of things because in Conrad's day, this final take, that it's all meaningless power and 
suffering and violence and predatory impulse is an extremely prevalent notion. Conrad is not being nearly as edgy as we might think here. He's speaking, he's representing a pre-existing suspicion on the part of many people in the Western world in 1899. So again, um, this German word zeitgeist, he's expressing the spirit of the age, very much so. Yes, and he is. And uncritically in that sense. Yeah, um, he is uh, basically uh, casting in narrative form what most other influential thinking people of his day were already suspecting that it's all pointless slaughter. And indeed, that's exactly how it's going to reify in the form of the Great War, pointless slaughter. And you find these scenes of pointlessness uh, scattered uh, very poignantly throughout the, the novella. You've got, for instance, the image of this gigantic warship, which of course would be a, 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 in most people's imagination in 1899, one of the central icons of human achievement and power. These things are great towering deadly engines of destruction and they're uh, at this time in history they're involved in an arms race around these gigantic warships and there's one of these gigantic super impressive warships and it's firing seemingly nonsensically into the jungle as if it's at war. Oh. And you find these scenes of mankind, uh, the futility of mankind uh, striving with this dangerous world scattered in these very striking, striking and poignant scenes throughout the story. Uh, so for instance, you've got the scene where um, Marlowe sees a giant European warship uh, firing into the jungle. And remember that this is a great uh, age of the arms race. The number one icon of human power and ability is uh, caught very iconographically in the form of the battleship. They were building these dreadnoughts and things like this at this time, and nobody had ever seen anything like this, these huge engines of destruction. And here one is, and it's firing into the jungle as if it's at war with nature itself. And it's ridiculous. Yeah, there doesn't seem to be any per particular purpose to the shelling. <laughs> no, it's it seems perfectly, it seems purely symbolic. Uh, it's it's human, a human engine of destruction at war with nature. And it's ridiculous because nature doesn't even notice you're there. Um, it's, a, it's similar to um, Thomas Hardy's Convergence of the Twain. Um, you know, we have such ridiculous pretensions about human ability, and then nature comes along and says, bink, that's the end of that. Um, we've got these other scenes of futility scattered throughout the text. You've got uh, the Africans at the other station who are blowing holes for no good reason in the rock and the dirt and what have you, and they're dying out there in chains for no good reason. Why no, is no it happening? Reason. Yeah, it, do, it doesn't even make sense, again, to ask the question. There is no why to any of this. And the farther away you get from the pretensions of civilization, um, the more you, clearly you can see that. And this seems to be the slowly dawning realization of Marlowe as he moves deeper and deeper into the heart of darkness. So I do think it's a critique of uh, the Western powers, but it's not a critique of colonialism per se. That's the that's the sort of the form, but the substance of the critique is that there is uh, an amoral, uh, uh, despairing, and yet powerful uh, expression there, which ultimately deserves critique, but it's not because of its condescending view of the Africans, because um, of course that's contemptible, but it's a, it's a far worse uh, and uh, indictment of that civilization than simply condescension towards the Africans. It's far worse than that. This is why I don't like talking about colonialism around this text, because the evils of colonialism as they manifest in the text um, are simply extensions of this more fundamental concern that it's all red of tooth and claw at the end of the day. And this is the horror of life. Yeah, yeah. So it, it, it is, I see it and I say it this way, it really is uh, an expression of the futility of Darwinism and its moral endeavors. It really, it's an expression of that. And I find it extraordinary that that doesn't occur to other people, but then maybe that's because as you say, they share that same viewpoint and are blind to it. Yes. Perhaps willfully blind to it. Well, this is the, the, a point I was making earlier, that the people who are operating under these illusions about reality, about value, about meaning, about purpose, about all these sorts of things, the nobility and, uh, of, of the human being and his or her uh, intrinsic value as an individual, um, 
the novel seems to imply that these are willfully, the, the masses of people are willfully self-deluded. They're not accidentally self-deluded. The illusion is comforting. It's, it yeah. serves a purpose. And if you try to disillusion them, actually, oftentimes they become angry and shrill with you because you're about to take away their safety blanket. Which is the noble, like, so the, 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 the myth of the noble savage. Yes. Um, notice that uh, the most noble characters in this, uh, most noble community in this text are the community of cannibals. Yep. They are de devourers of other human beings, and they're the good guys here. They're the ones who look admirable in this narrative. But I do say two things. Because they have an ethical framework. They, they're, they do eat people, but they don't eat every person at all times. There are conditions under which they will eat them, and they will not <laughs> breach that boundary. They have a moral guideline, and they won't violate it. Yes, they, 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 they have a, a, a horrific predatory etiquette and they stick to it in with a most admirable. Um, so you uh, go out camping with them is what you're saying then, Dr. Friesen. I would go out <laughs> camping with these guys. Absolutely, I would uh, be totally fine. It's the uh, it's the neo-colonialist uh, professor I'm worried about. <laughs> but that's OK. Absolutely. The cannibals might decide uh, that uh, he's looking particularly toothsome anyway. So, yeah. Um, I do tell my students, though, because they do sort of towards the end of our discussion uh, around the heart of darkness uh, seem to some of them uh, seem to adopt a degree of despair. And I'll tell them two things here that are counterpoints to the despair of the, no, uh, the this novella. The first is if you embraced the notion that life is an amoral, predatory experience of suffering uh, and violence. You would nevertheless be haunted, I suspect, that maybe there is such a thing as meaning, value, and purpose. Um, you, your faith in the pointlessness would get tested. Um, so we have to remember that. And that was a point made by C.S. Lewis uh, many years ago in some text, I can't remember what it was, where he said, you know, in one house at night, you've got some Christian lying in bed, doubting his faith. That happens, of course. But he says, but we, what we often forget from the perspective of faith is that right next door, the atheist is lying in bed and his faith too is fading into doubt as to whether or not there is a God. Both doubt, you can't escape from the doubt. Mm -hmm. So also with meaning and value and purpose and all these sorts of things. The second thing is in order to discern and be outraged by the violence and pointlessness of life, you have to have in your mind somehow, somewhere, a contradistinction relative to which you can see that that's you can't be bothered by this if you didn't have another notion it's opposite in your brain at some level of your psyche and consciousness here so you wouldn't recognize evil to be evil unless you had a notion of good you would yes. be oftentimes very binary creatures in that sense and use yes. binary opposition like this yes um so where did you get the notion that evil is bad in the first place or that violence is is bad in the first place where are you getting all this uh, outrage where where's this despair coming from what are you comparing the pointlessness to that's and this the is, question yeah no that's a that's brilliant and that is what makes this such a dark novel is there is no good in this novel. There is the privation of the good. There's the increasing privation of the good. There's the descent to want to embrace that, the very heart of the darkness. And Kurtz is the, uh, as it were, the pioneer of this exploration. In the end, he dies in darkness. Uh, his last gasp, the words, the horror, the horror, and literally just a whisper, and then he expires. And the and the uh, African boy who's with them expresses with, with disgust, Mr. Kurtz, he dead, walks out because this man who he thought was a god has died just like another man. So there's this, this odd, he doesn't go with a bang, he goes with a whimper. Yes. Uh, and, and so, but that is the darkness there. And yet, uh, Marlowe, who has just witnessed the scene, comes out of it, nonetheless, convinced that Kurtz is a great man in some way. This is extraordinary. How is he not uh, moved by this to depart from his ways, like at least in Frankenstein, as you said, we come out of that with a moral condemnation of the path of the scientist and this amoral path of progress, mm -hmm. uh, which is destroying humanity. We get no such thing here in this novella. And, and so it is full of darkness and the darkness is not, uh, as you say, contradistinguished by any light. There is no goodness here. There's nope. a privation of, of goodness. And that is its exploration of evil. Remember, evil in in a classical Christian definition uh, is has no being itself. It's the privation of the good. That right. is what evil is. 
it's it's literally nothing there's nothing there good is utterly whole holy it is utterly real it is utterly substantial and we only understand evil against the good as as that and that's that's it but it has no essence unto itself that is what this novel uh, novella i submit portrays and it does so um, by not using moral terms but by describing things uh wreathed in darkness and in shadow and so forth yeah um i think one of the things we need to consider here is that this novella would lose its power to impress to intrigue, to shock, to amaze, if indeed we, the readers, held actually the same moral worldview and zeitgeist that Kurtz does, or to some extent that Marlowe does at the end, we would not be, none of this would have make any impression on us. Uh, we would say, well, yes, that's simply how the world is. Why are you wasting my time by telling me this narrative? But we are taken aback by it. This is part of the attraction of the story itself. Um, because we have not fully embraced this violent, amoral, purposeless uh, world that these two have. Um, we should also note here that also towards the end, Kurtz growls, uh, exterminate the brutes. And he's talking about his Point. worshippers. He's literal, literal, literally his so. worshippers. And there's a psychological realism to that that I yes. find striking because people who go down the path that Kurtz go down, uh, the Villa to Mach, the, the will to power, uh, the pure hegemonic, amoral uh, worldview, driving their ambitions. These people, when they come to ruin, as they invariably do, usually try to burn their world down around them. A good example, but I could give you many different examples here, but a good example is Adolf Hitler when he's in yeah, his I was going to say, I was mentioning Hitler, and I was going to say Nero exactly the same. He's going to burn yeah. everything. Yeah, so he wants the German people to burn down entirely. It's utterly nihilistic, not just for himself, but everyone else around them. And it's that sheer ferocious, destructive impulse, which is, I think, at, not at the heart of darkness, but at the heart of evil. This is a very consistent feature of evil, as we encounter it, not just in literature, but sadly in history. But here's another odd thing about the psychological trajectory of the story which is that one of the things that we admire about Kurtz and maybe secondarily about Marlowe is that they at least are being honest about how life really is, or they seem to be trying to do that. But why would we, how could we admire that necessarily? Is honesty then a good? What exactly are we admiring? We're not admiring anything particularly efficient from a pragmatic standpoint. So what exactly is it that is admirable about their horrible honesty about how life really is? because uh, we are drawn to that is true. Um, but again, of course, my earlier point um, stands where it you know, stood before, which is that if you are saying honesty is good and life is really like this, and of course you have a basis of comparison that is implicit in the mind that perceives such honesty and therefore it deems this good, even though it's towards a twisted end. Mm -hmm. After you've already jettisoned the notions of truth and yes. so forth. Yes. Yeah, exactly. There's there's an, uh, some awful contradictions actually in what they're what they're uh, holding to, and people uh, uh, as a consequence of this worldview, people die. Lots of people die, and again, this is where the narrative always goes. I, again, I think that Conrad, in spite of his fundamental thesis, uh, is articulating really important truths about the human condition, human society, and things of that nature. What else should we talk about here, Bill? Well, um, it's also an intensely symbolic story. And I think, uh, okay. again, a lot, of, a lot of students try to read it purely literally and at times philosophically. Good. Um, so we, yeah. So we have a journey away from civilization into the heart of darkness. That is not obviously just a physical journey, as we've already noted. This is a psychological, moral, and philosophical journey as well. Um, and meaning and purpose become less than uh, become increasingly bankrupt the further we go into that fine um but, but it's then a heroic it's a heroic journey akin to that of odysseus right he is wandering there is an element and he will return from that so there is an element of a, a typical heroic narrative here yes right? this is the this is the uh, the voyage and return to, to use the cliched description um so that's all well and good um but then when we finally get onto the river, of course, the river um, and uh, and the vessel that he will pilot on the river give us a, a very useful sort of continuum of space and time. 
space in the vessel um and time is kind of the the, the river as river. it flows along yes yeah. the river of fate if you will or the river of the plot if you like um and notice a few other things symbolically which is that kurtz not kurtz marlow is a very good navigator of not just the actual physical river but he seems to be a good navigator of the psychological dangers and vagaries and uh, back eddies uh, mm -hmm. that occur in the text as well. He's a navigator and he's a navigator at many different levels and we're meant to be impressed by this. It's also a story of exploration. And remember we're still the 19th century is still very much, you said this area here in the center of Africa was blank. You're right, it was blank. Uh, this was terra incognita, um, but- But it was white. Yes. And uh, Kurtz is sailing up into that like an intrepid explorer, also again at this a psychological and uh, philosophical level. So we have this going on as well. We've got also the, we've got a, a pair of um, outposts that we can compare. We've got the outer station, then we have the inner station. Outer station is full of uh, pointless suffering, but full of intensity. There's a lot going on at the outer station and it's all kind of meaningless. But when we get to the inner station, notice what happens. Everybody is diseased with a horrible, vacuous uh, ennui and apathy. And the only person who keeps working uh, meaningfully and industriously is Marlowe himself as he tries to, well, he successfully does, raise, refloat, and uh, repair the riverboat, which has sunken in the shallows, for those of you who haven't read the text. Mm -hmm. uh, and that too, I would argue, is symbolically important. Mm -hmm. um, he's a man who contributes to this pointless environment in ways that are useful. Yeah. The other way that is reinforced, that symbolic uh, uh, thing that you've just discussed, is in the ending. So we talked about the frame narrative, mm -hmm. and we talked about Marlowe's narrative within that, which is presented in uh, quotations throughout. Um, and we mentioned that Marlowe lies when he returns from the Congo to Belgium and to and, and speaks to Kurtz as intended the his his betrothed mm -hmm. and he lies to her he doesn't tell her how he died and what he said and he said the last thing he mentioned was your name mm -hmm. <laughs> which of course he did not but uh his explanation for that is that it would have been too dark to have told her otherwise it would have been too dark he says and then it shifts to the frame narrator and the uh, the frame narrator talks about uh, London at that point, which appears to be in the heart of an immense darkness. So mm -hmm. there's these two references to darkness there. And there's this, obviously a symbolism and a parallelism going on there. Now, remember when Marlowe went to the Congo, it was presented as in the heart of darkness to some degree. He's traveling into the darkness, but when he emerges from the darkness, it turns out that he is going back into the darkness. So there is no escaping the darkness. And the darkness may well have lain all along in the imperial capital of England, the, the United Kingdom at that point, London. This is the great city, the tale of two cities. This is the other great city by the end of the 19th century. It probably is the great city of the earth. And once again, he began that, that Marla was saying this was once one of the dark places of the earth, but at that point, it was when it was colonized, but now it is the colonizer. And nonetheless, uh, he is suggesting that it is a dark place. Yeah, there's, I think, almost a degree of philosophical snobbery being deployed here at the end of the novel, by which he leaves uh, Kurtz's um, intended, as it were, in the darkness of ignorance about what's, what it was really like out there, uh, what really happened to Kurtz, all these sorts of things because in some sense, quote unquote, it's good for her. Um, she can't handle the truth, as it were, which uh, has now been revealed to Marlowe and was revealed to Kurtz and what have you. But now that he has this new enlightened, you'll excuse the ironic pun there, the new enlightened consciousness of Marlowe, um, he actually, he travels into the heart of darkness, but then in a sense, he brings his consciousness of it back to uh, this city, back to London, uh, and now he sees that London, too, is a place uh, covered in a darkness uh, equal to the darkness that he encountered morally, philosophically, spiritually, psychologically, deep down in the Congo. It's just that only a few heroic figures actually have the honesty and experience to recognize that all life is darkness, whether you're in London or in the deepest, darkest jungles of the Congo. And so he's, uh, you know, it, it's that appeal of the mystery cult. 
he has the sacred information that other mere mortals do not have. And so in some senses, he's more enlightened by his ability to see darkness everywhere. Mm -hmm. Yes, because it's, it's no longer just a particular place. It's everywhere. Every place is shrouded in the same sort of darkness. Yeah. So when Kurtz, uh, his last words, I mentioned them were the horror, the horror. What precisely do you think he's talking about there? It's not clear in the novella what the exact horror is. What What is your sense there? I mean, we are you and I are going to have to guess there, but I imagine yeah. that you venture to guess. I have ventured to guess. Well, first of all, let me return to what I said at the beginning, which is that I think it, uh, in some senses, it defies paraphrase, but it invites the attempt to paraphrase. Yep. So, um, and my notions here are somewhat different than a lot of other critics and readers of the novella might be. I'm thinking here that uh, Kurtz is realizing and embracing the sheer totality of the horror of life. Uh, we're going to start seeing a lot of people approach the danger of suicide much more aggressively and systematically in the 20th century. Uh, it's a common move by a lot of writers. Yes. Um, and I think part of that stems from the fact that those people too are embracing the reality of the horror of life. And that's really fundamentally what it is. Life is suffering and then the darkness. Um, so that's about as close as I can get to my understanding of the horror. It's just the full final death-like embrace of Kurtz uh, of the horror of life itself. And then darkness takes him. I think that's very good. Uh, I add to it, but it, it's even paraphrasing further when I do it. But I think it begins with uh, Francis Bacon and his use of science as a means of dominion, domination of nature. And by the 19th century, nature includes human nature, at which point the domination becomes the domination of humanity over itself. But that uh, uh, initiates a savagery on uh, incalculable sal savagery unknown uh, to past generations in which there is a sort of an efficiency about it and actually that's interesting because it's he he mentions in the novella that it's efficiency that distinguishes us distinguishes us from the uh, empires of old they did it uh they simply snatched and grabbed and took and plundered as it were whereas we do it for the sake of efficiency there's a commitment to a rational control of all things for the for the shake the sake of sheer power mm -hmm. um and there's a there's an utter savagery and there's no restraint upon it there it's not even uh, a pragmatic one per se there's almost an irrational embrace of nihilism there and it's already being expressed as we say in 1899 long before the, the world wars come and i don't think that there in our day has been sufficient critique of the very thing that led to such uh, atrocities and we rightly see colonialism as in some sense an atrocity it it is a, a way of evading the real atrocity which is a godless universe uh, in which yeah. we are the architects of human nature and to some degree we determine what human nature is that is the real problem here and it's a horror yeah, and in, insofar as we do that, all of us are playing Kurtz, if you like. Exactly. Um, and that is a deadly, deadly world because human beings do not have a compass that can guide them through that process. The compass is spinning. We should also note here that the darkness that is talked about, the horror that is talked about, is, is the darkness of the human heart for, fundamentally left to its own devices. And so you don't have to go to a Congo to locate the heart of darkness and understand it and learn about its nuances and dangers and so on. All you need to do is look in a mirror uh, and uh, look right. honestly, and mm -hmm. you're going to see a lot of darkness there. Um, and I think that's one of the values, actually, that does come out of this novella. Um, we're going to also see as we move into the very biblical theme, interestingly. It is. And we're going to see as we move into the 1920s and 30s um, that the dynamics of what you're talking about are only going to become more powerful and more articulately reified. Uh, there grows up a spirit of, remember, I, I, I tend not to call this nihilism as it informs a, and produces a horror, an atrocity like World War I. Uh, I, I always pair it with pragmatic nihilism. Uh, there's no, a they, they think there's a positive there. It's power. Yeah, there's, a, there's as you said, there's an efficiency to it. Why are you being efficient about nihilism? Well, that's a complicated discussion, but it's a, it's a consistent 
motif that you encounter in the writings uh, and, the, and the political thinkings as it increasingly they take ever more extreme and aggressive forms moving out of the Great War into the 20s and then into the 30s and then into the apocalypse of the Second World War. Um, these and are people, into our day in the modern use of technology for abortion and all manner of other horrors. Yeah, so th th there's a, ironically perhaps, there is an enormous purpose and ambition to these nihilists. They mean to do something and they're very efficient about doing it and they were very efficient about doing it. Look at the, uh, the death camps and stuff like this. Um, they are people full of purpose. They're unlike, uh, they're not like the people that we encounter in the novella at the inner station full of apathy lying around because it's all pointless. No, every now and again, somebody rises up in that world, and perhaps precisely because everybody else is filled with uh, despair and apathy and comes to dominate. And that person is full of purpose and the human psyche likes purpose, even dark purpose in the absence of any other purpose. And so the Hitlers and the Stalins of the world off they go and they do their thing and everybody follows energetically. They didn't just follow, they followed energetically. Kant calls the sublime purposiveness without purpose. That's a very <laughs> Kantian phrase. It trans but it is, there's a sense of purpose that has no purpose. That's yeah. the sublime. It's through it, 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 sh it shot through the whole novella here. Yeah, it's, uh, there is no anchor tethering it in one place. It, uh, Kurtz will decide where this ambition goes for reasons that he makes up by himself in the absence of God. And uh, time and again, this leads him to the heart of darkness. Brilliant. Well, Bill, I think we've really uh, given a, a, a good sketch of the novella and a diagnosis of its main themes uh, and some of its features. Is there anything you want to conclude with any other things or shall we move on to our topic for next week? Let's talk about next week a little bit, because uh, I think we've explored, at least uh, in an introductory sense, uh, many of what I think are the important aspects of this very important novella. But next week, we're going to look at something that um, is, seems to be perhaps as dark as, but actually offers us a, uh, ultimately, a clear therapeutic way forward to deal with the darkness and the wastelands and the pointlessness of life. And I'm talking here about T.S., uh, the work of T.S. Eliot. We will be looking at a few of his poems. We're going to center probably quite heavily on the love song of Alfred J. Prufrock, but I also want to talk about the wastelands and perhaps some of the other works turned out by what I would argue is one of the two greatest poets of the 20th century, T.S. Eliot, W.B. Yeats, and with honorable mention to W.H. Uh, Auden. Um, so I, I'm very much looking forward to that. All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's been a pleasure as always. And as always, I am Dr. Bill Friesen, and I'm joined by my colleague, Dr. Scott Masson. Thank you for listening, and we will see you presently and anon. See you next week.